we will begin this presentation with what is called the Oregon's model about the understanding of the Christian scriptures. Oregon was a very respected early theologian of the church and equally respected by Baden Blavatsky. He says that like the human being, the scriptures have a body, a soul, and a spirit. The body is the common and historical sense. The soul, a figurative meaning to be discovered by the exercise of the intellect. And a spirit, an inner and divine sense to be known only by those who have the mind of Christ. This kind of tripartite view of scriptures exists elsewhere. For example, in the Advaita Vedanta tradition, the student is encouraged to first develop the capacity to listen, that means sh shravana, then develop the capacity to reflect, and that is manana, and then develop the capacity to meditate on essential teachings, and that is nididhyasana. This ideas may be important for the work of the Theosophical Society. For example, on the 30th of October, 1875, the original founders of the Theosophical Society met in New York City, and they approve its bylaws. And the preamble to the bylaws say, that whatever may be the private opinions of its members, the society has no dogmas to enforce, no creed to disseminate. So this is a foundational principle of the TS. It has no official teaching, no official creed. This was in 1924, made into a global policy for the Theosophical Society known as the Resolution of Freedom of Thought, in which it says that no author, including Madame Blavatsky, has any authority to impose his or her views on the members of the society. So the society has this pillar for its work, and that is a non-dogmatic approach to truth. Let us consider briefly some of Madame Blavatsky's definitions of theosophy. In her book called The Key to Theosophy, she defines theosophy, or she uses the Greek word theosophia, literally divine wisdom, or wisdom of the gods. She also says divine knowledge or science. It's interesting that the ad adjective divine is always present, which means it's not referred to a particular view or someone's view, however exalted that person is, but a knowledge that comes from a transcendental dimension in life. She also said that theosophy is the shoreless ocean of universal truth, love and wisdom, reflecting its radiance on the earth, while the Theosophical Society is only a visible bubble on that reflection. That set things straight, so to speak, so that we can understand that the, theosophy, that the Theosophical Society does not speak on behalf of this trans transcendental wisdom. It gathers people who are students of this wisdom and who share their understanding with others on a non-dogmatic platform. She also said, it was formed to assist in showing to men, that is to people, that such a thing as theosophy exists and to help them to ascend towards it by studying and assimilating its eternal verities. The very wording of this statement is very interesting to ascend towards it. Again, emphasizing that theosophy per, uh, pertains to a transcendental level of existence uh, achieved by those who are ready to achieve it. 
and that the society helps, seeks to help people to ascend towards it by studying and assimilating its eternal verities. There is a difference between studying and assimilating. Of course, if study remains at the intellectual level, it will have very little impact on a person's life. But assimilation is different. For example, it has been said that if one meditates on the teaching about karma, which is in the theosophical literature, it figures prominently there. If one meditates on the teaching of karma, and if one assimilates that teaching, it generates an attitude of self-responsibility. That means one ceases to complain about life, about others, and so on. And one understands that, uh, that whatever happens to us happens under the activity and operation of a much wiser law. In her writings, Madame Blavatsky also used the Sanskrit expression Gupta Vidya. The Theosophical Glossary de defines Gupta Vidya as esoteric or a secret science. And uh, one of the very well-known authors in theosophical literature, Jeffrey Barbocca, in his book, The Divine Plan, um, says that Gupta Vidya is esoteric philosophy. It is a kind of philosophy that doesn't deal only with categories, uh, human-made categories, but goes much deeper than that. And, and contacts or understand the underlying principles in existence. Now, uh, Gupta Vidya comes from the Sanskrit word Gupta, which means protected, guarded, preserved, hidden, concealed. Uh, and Madame Blavatsky in The Secret Doctrine, in the introduction to The Secret Doctrine says that these teachings have always existed, but until now they have been kept hidden because those who were the custodians of, the, of these teachings didn't want to give away these pri priceless teachings to people who are still selfish and that could use the outcome of these teachings to advance their own self-centeredness. Finally, another word that she uses is Brahma Vidya. We are going to come back to this later on. The definition of Brahma Vidya, according to the Monier Williams Sanskrit Dictionary, is knowledge of the one self existing being, Brahma. Knowledge of the one self existing being. So this, and, and therefore, it, it, um, as we are going to see later on, Joy Mills correlates the word Brahma Vidya with the word Theosophy in a very interesting way. Now, I mentioned before that in the TS, there is this fundamental policy of freedom of thought. And people are, are encouraged to express their views within the limits of courtesy and consideration for others. Now, this is what happened when T. Subarao, a very eminent Hindu member of the TS in the late 19th century, and Madame Blavatsky expressed differing views about the human constitution on the pages of the Theosophist, which is a magazine she founded in October 1879 in Bombay which is now called Mumbai. Now, the entire exchange has been put online by the Australian section of the TS, and we are going to give the link to those who are interested. And we, I was part of this process, and we took pains to see that the precise original text was included without any editing. Uh, in, in this exchange, Mr. Subarao 
advocated a view of the human constitution which is fourfold, including four principles. And that is the physical vehicle, stulopadi, the subtle vehicle, sukshumopadi, then the causal vehicle, called karanopadi. And above all this is atma, which is the one self, the one self-existing self. And Madame Blavatsky disagreed from him. And she said that uh, she followed uh, the Arhat Buddhist system, which is very ancient, of seven principles. She called it, again, the physical, the physical vehicle, Stula Sharira, the Linga Sharira, which is the, the subtle vehicle, then the Prana, which is universal life or energy, Kama, which is desire, Manas, which is mind, Buddhi, which is intuitional wisdom, and Atma, which is the, the one self. And they disagreed profoundly, and they have enriched the, the heritage of theosophical literature by their exchange. And you, you can see uh, this in this link provided courtesy of the Australian section. Now, after Madame Blavatsky died, there were, there were an, a new generation of writers in theosophical literature, and the, the most well-known of those at that time were Annie Besson and C.W. Leadbeater. And when they presented their own classification of the human uh, constitution, there was what I used, I, I used to call a nomenclature war, because many people didn't accept their classification. They say that they departed from Madame Blavatsky, they, and they said, this is based on our own observation, and we offered them for consideration. In their uh, classification, they have the dense physical body, the etheric body, the astral body, the mental body, the causal body, buddhi as intuitional wisdom, and atma as the one self. Um, and many students found that this uh, classification is a simpler one, not necessarily to be discarded, and certainly not replacing the original classification that Madame Blavatsky or Subarao put forward. That's why we have included a table in this presentation coming from Norbert Lopert's article, Theosophy Objective and Subjective. It was published in The Theosophist in June 1982. And um, then this is also a courtesy of the website of the Australian section. In this table, his, he presents the traditional Christian view of the human constitution as consisting of body and soul, the Greek philosophy view, body, soul, and spirit, the Arhat Buddhist system, which we have already seen, the Vedanta philosophy, which is based about koshas or sheets of consciousness like Anamaya Kosha, Pranamaya Kosha, Manamaya Kosha, and so on, the Basin and Ledbeater view, and the Taraka Raja Yoga system, which Subarao presented. I would like to suggest that uh, uh, the society welcomes different views, and that if we choose only one description of the uh, human constitution as being the only true one, then we do not honor this tradition of welcoming different views. But this is for each student to find out. Now, I had uh, the opportunity to know more about the life and work of Mr. Sri Ram, who was our uh, fifth international president. I did write a very uh, short uh, biography of his. And he, he, he did something which was quite incredible. He created within the society a silent revolution. 
because the society at that time when he became president in early 1950s was very steeped into occult research, clairvoyance and psychic phenomena and so on. And he, he gradually through his writings and his lectures and his presence, he, he showed uh, uh, the membership of the society that without discarding all that, one can concentrate on theosophy itself as wisdom, not necessarily knowledge. And this is what he wrote. There are different possible approaches to what theosophy is. The longer one studies the wholeness of it, the less easy it is to define it. How can we define a wisdom which belongs to life, therefore lives and breathes in which there are depths which belong to what we call the spirit, which is subtler than the subtler's mind can encompass, whose every aspect is meaningful with the meaning of spirit. So I would like to focus on this. How can we define a wisdom which belongs to life, therefore lives and breeds, in which there are depths which belong to what we call the spirit? This is part of his article, Why Theosophy is Left Undefined. This was welcomed by a number of people, but there, there were some members of the society and students of the society, some of them quite well known, that uh, said to me that um, they couldn't agree with him because it gave, it gave an impression to them that theosophy was a bit of a wishy-washy thing and that it's, it's much better to be uh, rooted on concrete teachings that people can study and, and progress from there. Uh, but others felt that Sri Ram had a point here, that while we study theosophy, while we study the fundamentals of theosophy, and theosophy has a, a lot to say about life after death, about death itself, which is a, a very topical subject nowadays, about um, the nature of the mind, the nature of the emotions, and how the emotions tend to dominate the mind. This is what Madame Blavatsky called Kama Manas, the desire mind. Every single activity of the mind is dominated by desire. So he, he went very deep into the, this exploration and he said as president, that was his view, that theosophy had left undefined. That means it's for each one of us to probe to investigate further. Now, I suggested uh, uh, in, in this talk that theosophy uh, it can be seen as a creedless investigation. So we should consider this. What is investigation? And Sri Ramana Maharshi, one of the great sages of modern India, um, he, he had this uh, advice to his students that what you really need is to ask the question, who am I? And he says, if you pursue this investigation to its very end, this investigation basically will turn into ashes all the superficial contents of your mind and the residue that means the outcome of the investigation is Atma, the one existing self. And the, the word, the Sanskrit word he used is vichara. That means inquiry, pondering, consideration, investigation. It comes from the Sanskrit verb vichar, meaning to move in different directions spread, expand, and implies looking at something from different points of view so that the understanding of it is complete. I would suggest that the very existence of different views of the human constitution in theosophical literature aims at precisely this point because each one of them has a certain emphasis. 
And investigation means learning to look at something from different points of view. And when we do that, chances are that we will understand that a particular point of view is not the full truth. People are entitled to their views, to their points of views, but a particular point of view cannot encompass the wholeness of truth. And I'm re reminded here that a great Buddhist philosopher from the second century, Nagarjuna, said precisely this. Uh, according to historical uh, uh, reports from that time, several centuries after the death of the Buddha, the Buddhist tradition was splintered into different schools. And some, some of them had no negotiable views. And it took Nagarjuna to come and write and, and show to Buddhist uh, uh, students at that time that every opinion, this is what he actually wrote, every opinion is empty. Every point of view is empty. He didn't say that every opinion and uh, point of view may not be arrived at by in the process of investigation, but he was saying that essentially they are empty because there is in them, in every opinion, a very profound sense of partiality. And it's easy for us to cling to an opinion and, and therefore to criticize other people's opinion, but he said every, every opinion is empty. And uh, this, is, this is something that has profound relevance. And I found correlations to that in other traditions. For example, in the sermons of Meister Eckhart, he says, and his dominant theme is the, the birth of the Christ in the soul. And he said that, that it is in that abysmal depth of the human soul which is destitute of all views, of all opinions, of all memory and so on, of all images, that this new consciousness can be born. And, and, and you, if you go to other teachings, the same within, um, in Jewish mysticism, in the writings of Jalaluddin Rumi, it is very much there. And this realization, I su suggest, by these great sages, it's like a gateway to wisdom. Talking about wisdom, I had the greatest uh, privilege in my life to receive a scholarship from the Crotona Institute of Theosophy and being a resident student there in the winter 1983 term of the school. And the director of the school was Joy Mills. And as you know, she was a very knowledgeable person about theosophy and theosophical studies. In one of our afternoon classes, somebody from our group, I don't remember whom, asked Joy the question, what is theosophy? Now I have developed a theory of my own that whenever you ask a question for someone who is knowledgeable or wise, you may have to be prepared for self-demolition because that person does not function within the parameters of your own mind. So the question to Joy was, what is um, uh, theosophy? What is theosophy? And she used the, the Greek word, she put it on the whiteboard, theosophia, she separated them, theos, sophia, theos, the divine Sophia wisdom. But in another line, she wrote Brahma Vidya, which is a synonym according to Madame Blavatsky. She said that the word theos in Greek comes from a verb thing, which means to grow. The word Brahma comes from a verb in Sanskrit, which means bri, which also means to grow. And, uh, and the word vidya in Sanskrit comes from a, a verbal root called vid, 
which means to see. So according to Joy Mills, whatever she is, theosophy is a way of seeing which is constantly growing. In other words, utterly non-dogmatic, experiential, inviting one to go beyond one accepted knowledge, sometimes to suspend one knowledge and continue this investigation. And she said, a mind that is constantly growing in seeing, and she said, that is a good definition of wisdom. A, a wisdom, uh, and uh, Jalaluddin Rumi had a very good definition. He wrote in his book, Masnavi, wisdom is a mind that loves and a heart that sees. The mind has an understanding which is not cerebral, cold, intellectual, but an affectionate understanding. And the heart has sympathies which are not parochial, self-centered, but are universal sympathies. So these two aspects of our nature becomes integrated. And perhaps this was one of the reasons why the society was formed, not only to share with people this ancient knowledge about the, the meaning of existence and the, the different levels in the human being, but moving them closer to not an idea, but an experience of, of wisdom. In many traditions, this experience is equated with love. And um, um, in the Buddhist tradition, for example, I, I was able to visit Badula in Sri Lanka in 2004. And I was told that the Buddha visited Badula with 500 arhats. Just imagine. And there was a criminal there called Angulimala. He had a nasty habit. He said, what, whatever persons he robbed, he would chop off a finger of that person and put that in his mala. So Angulimala means a mala of severed fingers. And he was taught about as a very dangerous individual. And he knew the Buddha was there and he wanted to rob the Buddha because he knew he was a prominent man. And in the Buddha's camp at night, everybody was asleep, including the Buddha. And Angulimala, came, tried to come near him. This is what the legend says. Tried to come near him. But the moment he entered within the field of influence of the Buddha, he became immediately aware that his way of life was wrong. The Buddha didn't tell him that. The Buddha was asleep. And the moment he realized that, he dropped that way of life and he became a, a great disciple of the Buddha. You can Google his name, Angulimala. So I, I come back to the beginning that uh, the society, the Theosophical Society has a great deal to offer, but it can only offer this great deal of opportunities to people if it, it reinforces the need for a non-dogmatic platform, and that encourages people, while to have their own opinions, not to make the exercise of their, their opinions a form of war. And in the history of the society, this at times happened, but the society survived. If the society survived, I would like to say it's because there were enough number of people who realized that is not, it's not worthy to fight over opinions. I hope my presentation has not been too dogmatic. Thank you. I hope you found that presentation to be of interest. And of course, I'd like to invite you to join us again Thursday next week. Next week, we will have Dr. Steve Taylor speaking on from separateness to oneness. 
the roots of human cruelty and how connection can heal the world. I do hope you can join me for that lecture. In the meantime, stay safe and be well. Good night to you all.